Well, it's 10 o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to another fireside chat with the experts. I'm um, pretty excited about this one. We're gonna be covering a topic that we get a lot of, uh, a lot of questions about, a lot of curiosity from uh, different industries. The question is, can radiation damage my components? Um, so we have Dr. Bill Cardoso here. He'll be speaking to us to answer this question. Um, so um, it's a complicated one. So it's good we have someone with a PhD here to, to get into the details of it and uh, explain it to us. So uh, go ahead, Bill. All right, thanks, David. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here with us for another fireside chat with the experts. And, and yes, the question uh, we're gonna try to address today is if radiation uh, can damage electronic components. And um, I'll actually start with some of the background. That's where um, I learned a lot about uh, radiation effects on electronic components. That was a Fermi lab, which is Fermi, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Uh, it's a particle accelerator in right outside Chicago. It's about 40 miles west of Chicago. Well, 40 miles east of Chicago in the middle of Lake Michigan. So it's, it's got to be west of Chicago. And uh, at Fermilab, uh, we had a uh, six mile long ring uh, called Tevatron that you can see here uh, in this photograph. And uh, the Tevatron was a particle accelerator. So uh, there, there's a, a, a complex of uh, smaller accelerator, accelerators. This is the main injector that produces uh, protons and antiprotons uh, that get uh, successfully faster and faster. So when you get to the to the Tevatron, which is this big six mile long ring here, uh, they are flying at uh, very close to the speed of light. And what we do is we we get them uh, going around the ring in one direction, and then get we got we get the antiprotons going in the opposite direction, and um, so the two clouds of uh, subparticles, of particles, they go, they keep flying over each other. And then in a couple of very specific places, namely the D0 here and uh, CDF here and D0 further down the line, uh, we merge them so they have a head-on collision. So we have these protons and antiprotons uh, colliding at very, very fast speeds. And uh, as a result, we have the shower subparticles and with those subparticles, sub uh, we can study quite a few things. Uh, the last thing we were looking for at Fermilab was the Higgs boson, which, um, you know, physicists say uh, explains quite a bit of uh, the dark matter and, and things that are missing that we can't account for uh, in the universe. So uh, these are some of the things that I, uh, the group I was part of did at Fermilab. We designed these this cameras uh, that uh, tracked the shower of subparticles. And as you could imagine, this uh, electronics uh, get subjected to an incredible amount of radiation, right? Um, and much like uh, satellites, uh, this, um, this, uh, the systems have to be built with incredible reliability because once you dig this electronics several floors uh, under, um, underground, uh, you basically, you can't uh, maintain them. So if something breaks, it's gonna be broken until the next shutdown, which might take two, three, four years, right? Uh, so radiation uh, damage and radiation uh, effects on electronics was something we took very seriously and we did a lot of research to understand exactly how radiation would impact the lifespan of the components, uh, the cables, uh, the kept on tape, everything that we used uh, you know, PCB, uh, print circuit boards, and everything else we used on those electronics because, as I said, it was an incredibly high radiation environment. And at the same time, you couldn't fix them, right? So, uh, to give you an idea, to unplug uh, this, uh, so this, this um, uh, high definition cameras, if you will, uh, was placed uh, right on the beam. So, the beam of protons and antiprotons would come through this pipe here. So we built this huge you know, building size uh, particle detector. And once it was done, we just roll it into the beam. And several years later, we roll it out for upgrades and major uh, maintenance. So 
the question is simple, right? Can, uh, is, go is radiation gonna damage my, my electronics, my components, my, you know, whatever? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is quite complicated. It's uh, not only complicated, but it's also complex because it depends on a lot of things. So in this presentation, we're not gonna answer the question, okay? If you're expecting to get a yes or no answer out of this presentation, uh, just go to the next video right now or, or go do something else because you're not gonna get a yes or no answer. Uh, what we're gonna do today is to build up the, uh, and explain what are the parameters that they're gonna lead you to an answer, right? And, uh, and we're more than happy uh, to sit down with you if you, if you do have questions uh, and, you know, contact us. We're gonna give you our contact information at the end of this presentation uh, so that you can call us and we can work through some of these questions to figure out if, if, uh, uh, if the electronic component that you're testing uh, has a chance or not of being damaged by uh, the radiation exposure you plan to subject that uh, uh, part to. So the let's start with the, from the beginning, right? Uh, from the basics, uh, which is types of radiation. Now, there are two main types of radiation we're gonna be talking about here. Rays, let's call them rays and particles. Let's keep it simple, right? Rays and particles. Rays like photons, and that's the most popular ones, the gamma rays and X-rays, that's what we do for a living, right? So those are rays, they're photons. And then you have particles. Stuff that we did at Fermilab, like I described a couple slides ago, those are all particles. Protons, antiprotons, uh, uh, other accelerators have electrons. And um, there's a major difference between uh, a photon, uh, as you can see here uh, on this column, and particles, as you can see, uh, you know, protons and, um, and electrons. For example, protons are very heavy, uh, very dense uh, particles. Uh, they, you know, they can't really travel very fast. Electrons, you know, protons, they have um, uh, quarks. They usually have three quarks. The quarks that can, um, uh, you know, it, it's a massive particle. It, it, it can transform into a gluon. And so protons can be very, um, uh, very complex uh, particles. Uh, electrons, on the other hand, are point light particles. They're much simpler. Uh, some accelerators use electrons because they are, um, uh, since they're point-like and very um, um, uh, easy to study because uh, the energy that you uh, give to an electron is the energy that's going to take. Uh, protons, you don't, we don't ever know what state the proton is, so you can't really always tell the um, energy uh, of the proton. Uh, physicists uh, like to say that colliding protons and antiprotons are like colliding trash cans. Uh, and uh, while electron colliders are scaffolds, right? They're very precise, very fine uh, research. And there's a reason why you do one or the other. Um, photons, they travel the speed of light uh, because they uh, don't have any mass, right? Uh, as you can see here, um, protons are heavy compared to electrons. Photons don't have any mass. Uh, that's the reason why uh, particles have a, a very intimate and destructive relationship uh, when they collide with matter, while uh, X-rays and gamma rays, uh, they have a different type of interaction. They tend to penetrate, right? Uh, so this, I really like to show this, um, uh, this uh, uh, representation here where you can see how alpha particles have uh, a very limited penetration of matter. Uh, usually a piece of paper can stop uh, alpha particles from, um, from, uh, from traveling. Uh, and that's the reason why I'm releasing 241, which is a, a particle, an alpha particle generator, uh, radioisotope is using your smoke detectors in your house. Uh, what you do is you put a sensor and uh, I'm releasing 241 source and that sensor is always getting uh, radiation. So, okay. The path there is open. As soon as smoke goes in between, close the path and triggers the alarm. So phenomenal uh, 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 source of, um, of um, uh, um, uh, detection of smoke. And that's why you have to replace your 
smoke detector every so often because that emission source has a half-life that eventually uh, doesn't work anymore. Beta particles uh, have, uh, you know, uh, they are um, electrons, so they're smaller particles, and they, as a result, they have a better penetrating force. Uh, a piece of wood, I mean, a piece of metal can stop a beta particle with no problem. Gamers in x-rays, on the other hand, they have much better penetration power, and that's why you use them for inspection, for imaging, right? Uh, gamma rays are very good, uh, so, uh, x-rays are very good uh, for imaging because we can uh, get them to penetrate through the matter, uh, through your component. On the other side, you can create the shadowgram uh, to give us the uh, image or the shadow, a negative image of the component that you're looking at. So electromagnetic, electromagnetic uh, radiation, X-rays and gamma rays, particles, you have protons, neutrons, electrons, pions and muons and everything, the soup of letters afterwards uh, of uh, different types of um, uh, particles that interact with matter. For the most part, damage happens with particles because particles have mass and when you jam them against your component, they're gonna damage something. At, uh, again, at the Fermilab, our main concern was protons and antiprotons and, and, uh, and uh, soup of the particles that came after that, those collisions, and they did quite a bit of damage uh, to the components that we installed. And um, electromagnetic uh, radiation is fairly um, uh, docile uh, to electronics. So, before we, we get into the exposure from our X-ray machines, let's talk a bit what else or where else uh, your parts, your electronic components are gonna be uh, subject to radiation. Uh, starting with uh, background radiation, right? We're all subject, as you know, to radiation 24-7. Uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the concrete uh, that we use in our construction has radioactive components. Uh, radioisotopes, they're going to be radiation in, and the, uh, um, the soil, and depending on what kind of soil you have, how much granite and some of the other materials uh, on, the, on, on the soil, uh, can, can give you a higher or lower uh, background radiation. So uh, there are maps online you can check out uh, that plot the, or map the radiation, the background radiation as a function of geography. Uh, in the United States and other places in the world. Then on top of that, you have cosmic radiation. Uh, the uh, atmosphere uh, serves as a shield, right, from uh, cosmic uh, rays uh, that come from uh, stars that implode or galaxies that explode and emit a huge amount of uh, uh, radiation, many millions higher than any atomic bomb can produce. And those, um, uh, those uh, uh, that radiation travels around the, uh, across the universe, and the atmosphere is our shield, right? So depending on the altitude, you're going to have more or less of the shield, and as a result, more or less cosmic radiation um, being subjected to your um, your components. And then on top of that, we have man-made radiation, right? Including inspection on airport. Every airport you're going to go through is going to X-ray your part, your components, your luggage, everything, right? Nowadays, you don't have an option. You're gonna get x-rayed. Even if you don't know, your components are gonna get x-rayed. Uh, ports of entry, all right? As you get in and out of the country, um, uh, Customs and Border Protection, CBP, uh, is going to use very sophisticated and very strong um, uh, radiation uh, portals to image uh, the containers where your, your components are gonna be uh, shipped. Uh, the post office all around the country have x-ray machines that are constantly inspecting mail as it comes and goes. Uh, and same goes for every delivery company out there, FedEx, UPS, DHL, they all have uh, radiation um, uh, x-ray units uh, to image. And that is a, um, uh, it's ubiquitous. That's nothing you can avoid. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's how uh, the flow of commerce is regulated and protected uh, in the world nowadays. So uh, security, quality assurance, fair analysis, counterfeit detectors, these are all uh, 
some of the main uh, applications that require uh, uh, putting radiation and or subjecting your components in your parts to uh, a radiation. So part of the conversation, now that we have some of the basics of where radiation is, what type of radiations are impact components, how different radiations impact, uh, impact electronics, let's, uh, uh, let's go over how and what's the mechanism of damage, right? So there are, when you think about uh, if uh, radiation is gonna damage my component, the first thing you've got to figure out is what kind of radiation are you subjecting your component to? As we said before, particles have, uh, are much more destructive than photons. Larger particles uh, have a much higher probability that they're gonna damage your component than uh, smaller particles, protons against uh, electrons. And, uh, and finally, if you have, um, you know, if you have uh, photons, it's a much, much, much smaller probability that you're gonna have uh, any damage. Then once you figure out what type of radiation you are uh, considering, the next question you're gonna ask yourself is, uh, what energy level are you gonna be working at, right? The more energetic uh, the radiation, the higher the probability that you're gonna damage uh, your component. Once you figure out the type of radiation and how energy you're gonna be talking about, in X-ray terms, uh, the energy would be 80 kV, 100 kV, 160 kV, 50 kV, right? Watch how much energy those photons or particles are gonna have once they collide with your electronics. Then the next is radiation flux, which means it is, uh, what is, how many of those particles or photons are gonna be hitting your component per second? In X-ray lingo, energy is kV, radiation flux is ma. How big, how much energy the photon has, radiation flux, how many of those photons you have hitting your component or going through your component every second. And finally, the fourth component, fourth leg on this chair is the exposure time. So what kind of radiation, how big it is, how much of it, and for how long you're gonna be exposing uh, your component. You gotta know all these four parameters before we even start talking uh, if you're gonna have damage uh, or not. And when you talk about damage, there are three mechanisms of damage on electronics, right? You start with the bulk damage. Bulk damage is serious. It's very, very serious. We're gonna start with the most serious to the least serious, okay? The big one is bulk damage. Bulk damage is when you can transfer enough energy to the silicon atom that you can remove it from the crystal lattice, right? So it's, once, if you can do that, if you have enough energy to uh, um, uh, impact the crystal lattice, the crystal lattice, your silicon component is done. And I don't know if any X-ray inspection system in the market, X-ray inspection system in the market that has enough energy that's capable of applying bulk damage to electron components. So bulk damage is very common when you're talking in the particle accelerators, where particles, if they are, you know, the gig, uh, gig electrovolt, like we do kilovolt, right? Which is thousands of volts. Uh, gigavolt, it's billions or millions of volts. Uh, that's when you start talking about uh, bulk damage. And, um, in, uh, and again, in particle accelerators, what you do is you figure out how much radiation your components is going to, is capable of taking before it gets damaged. And you just figure out how long, what's the lifespan or expected lifespan of the component. So if you wanna run, if you figure out electronics can survive five years and your experiment is expected to run for two years, said, okay, we're fine. Because you, this is likely gonna die after our experiment is uh, scheduled to be over. Surface damage, on the other hand, as the name suggests, is when you, uh, when you have ionized radiation going through uh, the silicon oxide, uh, you basically build up over time enough charge 
to change the characteristics of the silicon oxide. Very common um, to um, a change threshold of uh, transistors, right? So what happens over time, very common to see. Over time, uh, you have enough uh, electron hole pairs created on the base of a transistor. And what you do is you change the threshold. So as time goes by, all of a sudden, some of the transistors in your memory, for example, stop working, right? Because now the threshold is here and you put in your signal here. Your threshold started here, I know on off was here, everything was working beautiful, electron holes accumulate, your signal is here, threshold is there, before you know your, um, uh, you know, a section of your transistors don't work anymore. It's a pain in, a pain in the neck and that's destructive. Once it's done, it's done. The last one, it's a SEU, single event upset. Single event upset, uh, very common in um, um, satellite applications and, and, uh, uh, and also particle detectors. Uh, this, is when, this is one when uh, uh, a radiation, a particle can, uh, has enough energy to flip the state of a, um, of, uh, a transistor, for example, right? That's called a single event upset. So what happens is uh, you have, um, uh, you going back to the base of that transistor we were talking about, you set it to a flip and you have a infrared radiation to deposit energy on the base of the transistor to make it to a flop. So instead of flip, you flop and you can flip the state of that specific transistor. Now, usually, uh, you think of an upset is a recoverable defect. In other words, if you just override again, that transistor is going, goes back to its initial uh, or correct state. And uh, one of the standard ways to deal with this problem is uh, to use a triple mode redundancy. So that means that instead of putting one transistor, you put three transistors in very critical locations, meaning that uh, you always take the results of two out of three. So you have a voting system for each flip-flop. So if one gets flipped, one gets upset, the other two can give you the right uh, result, right? So the probability that three or two will be flipped at, one, at a time is extremely slow, low. And you measure, calculate the probability that's going to low, figure out where you're going to put those transistors. And with uh, triple model redundancy, you can uh, really mitigate uh, single event upset. So uh, the point here is that radiation is everywhere and your components are gonna be exposed to quite a bit of radiation in a daily basis, if you wonder or not. Uh, Miriam uh, Ortiz, our VP of manufacturing, gave a really nice presentation where she went over safety of X-ray systems and she went over um, uh, some of these units, uh, MRO hour. So I highly recommend you go check her presentation uh, uh, if you need some clarity what MR hour means and uh, how much radiation uh, the uh, uh, FDA recommends um, or sets as a limit uh, for safety uh, in the country. We are bombarded by a soup of uh, particles and uh, photons in a daily basis. Uh, and at cruise altitude, like you were saying, looking at see, look, um, on this plane, you have, you're gonna be uh, subject to about uh, 0.6 mR hour of uh, radiation. Um, one interesting experiment I've done a few times, uh, get yourself a radiation detector, a Geiger counter, and bring it on the next flight, and you'll be able to see uh, it changes as you take off and you cruise at 35,000 uh, feet. So, as we said before, any type of cargo is going to be inspected with not only kilovolts, but sometimes mega electron volts, right? So, mega in millions, then giga in, uh, in, in billions. So, kilovolts, thousands, um, megavolts, uh, MEV you're gonna be in the millions and then giga electron volts are gonna be in the billions. So a lot of the uh, cargo scanners are uh, six MeV 
or 90 MeV, so millions of volts, not kilovolts like we do. Uh, and uh, it's, so it's not uncommon to have that specific component that you're really concerned about putting in your X-ray machine. It's already being inspected by a bunch of, of uh, radiation generating device that you don't even know, right? So you gotta be very careful about that. <clears throat> and uh, it's very easy for that exposure of all these devices combined can, can, can accumulate to hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of uh, uh, MR. We, the device we use for counterfeit detection, which is failure analysis and counterfeit detection, that's mainly where uh, we use our X-ray machines for. Uh, in the component arena, uh, they're going to be between 80 and 160 kV. You don't really need more than 160 kV to look at an electronic component. And uh, we're looking at um, exposure times even lower than 200 milliseconds at a time, depending on the component you have. So if, you, if you're running your component, uh, you know, if, imagine you're going to be looking at a component for a second or less. Uh, at 180 kV, you're going to be looking at 35 MR uh, for of total dose, right, for that specific component. So, in the big scheme of things, based on all the numbers I've given you before, this is very, very little radiation, right? We've got to agree with that. <clears throat> so, based on those parameters that I gave before, right, it's type of radiation, the energy, flux, and the time. This, you want to minimize all those four parameters to give you the least amount of radiation possible uh, exposure in your component. So what you do is uh, you automate your system. And that's why we've been very successful at uh, offering our customers fully automated uh, X-ray inspection systems because you expose each component at the least amount of time possible with the least amount of radiation possible and you let uh, uh, um, a computer vision program makes some of the decisions so you don't have to have a human being looking at the monitor figuring out if something is pass or fail. Uh, a Boeing 737, for example, if, if it has a, um, uh, a lifespan, let's say 50,000 hours, we're looking at over 30,000 MR just due to background radiation plus everything else that's going to be uh, exposed to for regular inspections, right? For, uh, um, for uh, X-ray inspections that are applied to the, to the fuselage and other parts of the airplane, which are regular on the maintenance of these uh, aircraft. So I hope uh, we're able to give you an overview of um, how radiation and why radiation can damage electronic components and how little relative radiation X-ray machines actually apply on radiation components uh, that end up, we, it's hard to say that there will be no damage ever, right? Because we're not, we know enough not to make blank statements like that. But what we want to do is to invite you to a conversation. If you have any concerns, please give us a call and we can walk, walk through this, pro, uh, this problem. Okay, thanks for your time. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions, David. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That was very helpful. Um, a lot of detail there. Got a couple of questions. Um, looks like we got two minutes left here. Um, one is asking about the energy to distance ratio. Uh, you gave us those four factors uh, causing the damage to component. Is distance a factor there? If it's an 80 kV source running at full power, is that just the number we use? Yeah, that's a good question. And I, uh, thanks for bringing it up. Distance is definitely uh, uh, a consideration here uh, because as you know, radiation drops one over R square. <coughs> so the, the distance is gonna be inside that flux information uh, parameter that we discussed, right? So the, the more distance you have, the lower the flux you're gonna have on your, on your part, especially because we have this cone beam, right? So the flux you have in your source goes down one over R square relative to the distance uh, to the source. Very good question. Another question along the same lines. Um, if I have a, a populated board in an x-ray inspection system, I'm panning around the board for about five minutes. Do I need to calculate that, that five minutes as the exposure time? Or is that going to be something less than that? 
so we have a cone beam, right? Let's start there, uh, which means that the uh, the uh, radiation is going to reduce reduce exponentially as you move away from the center point on the source. Uh, the sources, so that's uh, a data point one. Data point two is uh, our sources have a specific angle of, uh, uh, of the target, which means that uh, the cone beam has a very specific shape. And that shape is uh, determined by the angle of the target uh, on, the to on the source with that reflects uh, the uh, uh, electron beam that hits the target. In other words, that angle can be 20 degrees, can be 40 degrees, can be 90 degrees for a white beam uh, source. So based on that angle, you can understand how much of your components on the board have been radiated or exposed to radiation, right? So for applications that are really concerned with, um, with the radiation exposure of the neighboring components uh, on the board, uh, what do we do is we collimate. In other words, we minimize the exposure to neighboring components as we're expecting uh, the uh, object under study. Does it make sense? So it's a way to, uh, you know, basically put a canopy and a shield and protect all the neighbors that we're not looking at at the specific time, and we only expose what we're interested in at the specific time, thus minimizing radiation uh, to the neighbors. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Really appreciate answering those questions for us. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any more questions, give us a call, email us, uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube later, go ahead and comment below. Um, and we're looking forward to having just a Q&A session uh, in July sometime where we'll get to some of these questions that we weren't able to get to in our, our previous chat. So thank you all for joining us. I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, next week, we're looking at another good chat uh, titled 10 Ways to Find Counterfeit Electronic Components Using X-Rays. So be sure to join us again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Play what you want.